Hey everybody and welcome to module 3.1 for ME171. In this section of module 3, we're going to be getting into chapter 2, taking a look at load analysis. So as we begin this module here, we're going to do a little bit of a review of our forward and inverse problems. Now for a forward problem, recall there's some specific given information that we have as we begin the design process. Now this may be information provided from the client, customer, uh, funding agency of a grant, research project, something like that. Either way, we're given information about the machine configuration, what the part dimensions need to be, and what materials we need to use. So these are already specified to us of what we need to use for those. Now with that information, we need to utilize some of our knowledge from previous courses in order to make sure that we design this correctly. So if we want to determine the performance and reliability, this is going to relate back to what we learned in our statics and our dynamics courses. We also, if we want to make sure that it works and doesn't fail, then we bring in some of our mechanics of solids, our ME14 class, and materials engineering, our ME124 lab, where we talked about actually doing out some of the testing for these prototypes, products, and parts. Now, if we're talking about an inverse problem, then what we're given is a little bit different. Rather than be giving the specifications we saw in the forward problem, now we're going to be given information regarding what the performance and reliability needs to be. So they're not really specifying, okay, it needs to be this that exact material and this exact dimensions, but it needs to perform in a certain way and have this amount of reliability. For, from that, what we need to determine with that information is what is the machine configuration, what are the part dimensions, what are the material. So this was, in a forward problem, this is the information that was given to us, but in an inverse problem, this is what we need to determine from their performance and reliability requirements. And then from there, what we need to do is convince why this is the best, why what we chose for these materials, parts, and configurations is going to be the best. And that's what we talked about going through that kind of like down-selecting process where we have a couple different ideas, and we go from there, organize them in a nice, easy manner, like spreadsheet or matrix, where we can go through and figure out, okay, this one is going to end up being what's best for us. And at minimal, it shouldn't fail, but we should have a little bit better criteria than that, and obviously we need to meet the performance and reliability that they had provided to us. So we talked about needing to go back and review some of the information and knowledge we'd learned from previous courses here as far as mechanics go for our design project here. So if we talk about going back to our first course here, statics, what information do we need to recall from statics in order to apply it to these design projects now? Well, one of the things we need to do is free body diagram. And we've seen this over and over again. Yes, we may have seen it first in statics. We've also seen it in dynamics and in our mechanics of solids as well. Uh, we also need to go back and review information regarding forces, moments, and torques, how we apply to those problems, how we solve those out, then talk a little bit about static equilibrium of forces and moments, so how do we apply those there, summation of forces, summation of moments from our free body diagram information. Then we discuss our method of joints and discuss friction as well. So these are all things that are going to come back into play that we need to refresh ourselves on from our statics course. Now as we move into dynamics, then we can talk about linear and rotational inertia that may become important there. Uh, depending on what you have, there may be some other things from dynamics we need to do as well. If there's a, a gun or a catapult, so maybe some projectile motion problems, things like that will come back into play from our dynamics courses. Um, then we go on to ME14, mechanics of solids. From this one here, we need to recall our method of sections shear and moment diagrams, uh, stress and strain, how do we derive those, utilizing Hooke's law, and then our stress and strain transformation. So this is all information that we're going to utilize again for this course. And back to uh, materials lab here, this is where we can talk about doing some of our actual testing, tensile testing in particular in this case here, looking at our yield strength, modular elasticity, and all of that information that we can gather uh, from our ME124 lab that we learned. So for all of this, there are a couple of laws that are going to become important. One of the main laws that we're going to utilize a lot is Newton's laws right here. So if we talk about Newton's second law right here, we have an object uh, in the state of uniform motion tends to remain in the state of motion unless an external force is applied to it. So then we have the relationship between the object's mass, which we're denoting as M, its acceleration, we're, we're calling A, and its applied force here, F. So this we call here is F is equal to MA. You can see this is a vector here for force, and this is a vector here for mass. It has both magnitude and direction. Now we can also use some of other Newton's laws here. We say every action, there's an equal opposite reaction. So this is where we do our, a lot of our reactions when we're taking a look at some of our, our uh, supports and joints uh, within um, different projects, different diagrams, different setups there. So this is F plus R is equal to zero. Again, for every action, there is an equal and opposite 
reaction right here. So this is going to become important again uh, for some of these problems as well within our design. So then we move on to equilibrium. Now we're going to talk a little equilibrium in two different parts if we're dealing with static or if we're dealing with dynamic. Are things staying stationary or are things in motion? So if we're dealing with static, we can go back to, again, our free body diagrams. We take a look at our initial diagram. We draw out our free body diagram. What are all our external forces, external moments acting on it there? And then we look at those. What direction are they acting in? Break it down. Choose a given coordinate system, X, Y, Z, for a standard Cartesian coordinate system there in three dimensions. And we say, okay, let's just look at one direction here. Let's just look at our X direction. What are our summation of forces before we're acting in the X direction? These are going to sum to zero. So summation of forces in the X direction is zero. Then again, we look at our Y direction separately. Well, external forces are acting in our Y direction. So then we could zero for static and the same for Z. Then we do the same thing for moments. Go through our free body diagram, take a look. Moment is going to be four times our perpendicular distance away from it, from whatever point we're summing the moments about. So we say summation of moments in the X direction is zero, whatever those summations of moments are. Take a look in our Y direction, what are those moments? Those are equal to zero. Same as our Z direction, what are those moments? And set those equal to zero. So this is our equilibrium equations for if we're dealing with something that's not in motion or static right here. Now, if we are talking about an object in motion here, we're dealing with dynamics here. That's where Newton's second law comes into play here as far as our forces go. And we can say estimation of forces in the x is equal to that mass times acceleration from Newton's second law right there. But again, we want to break this down in terms of individual x, y, and z components. And we can do the same thing for in motion for our moments, break them down in terms of x, y, and z components as well for our moments in motion. And this is going to be equal to the right side of our i alpha over here. Again, broken down in terms of X, Y, and Z components separately. So as we're talking about problem solving in general or for load analysis, there's a group of questions that we want to ask ourselves. And this leads into why I have our homework problem format, our exam problem format, all set up in that same manner where you're listing out your givens, listing out what they're asking you to solve for, listing out your assumptions, very clearly labeling what is your governing key equation, and talking about your steps along the way. So the reason behind this is because this is going to help you as you're setting up to solve for any type of problem solving. So in this case here, what questions should we be asking ourselves as we're going through these problem solving steps? Well, what is known? So this is that given section. You're reading through the problem statement. You're reading through uh, the given information from the client. You're reading through the, the funding agency's grant, whatever it is. What do you know? Then from there, once you've read through that and highlighted what you do know, what do you still need to find? So this is your find section there. So based off of what they're asking for in the problem statement or from your client or whoever it is, what do you still need to solve for? What do you need to find? Then the next step there is what assumptions can you make to help simplify things down? So that's great. Like we could say, okay, it's on an icy surface, so friction is going to be close to zero. We're going to assume no friction. Things like that, whether it's from a keyword in the problem statement or it's within the description of, of the project or the grant or whatever it is. From there, once you have everything down that you know, and you know what you're looking for, and you know what assumptions you can make, then you can take that information, and that will help you for, figure out what theory and analysis method, what your governing equation is going to be as you're moving forward to solve this. And from there, once you have solved it out, how can you double check the answers? Maybe there's a different method, a different governing equation you could use as a double check. Maybe you're doing unit analysis out. Maybe you have practical versus theoretical results that you can compare it to. So this is important here to always double check your work, your answer one way or another. So now we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the question of what is known. We've talked about this first with the simple geometry cases here. And if we're dealing with simple geometry cases here, one of the things we're going to ask is what are we physically dealing? What is the name of the object or part that we're actually dealing with here? Here, Well, is it a beam? Is it a bar? Is it a column, shaft, angle, cable? What is it? And based on what it is, there's a lot of information that we have, some governing equations we can use, some charts and tables we can look to for different types of objects here, just simply based upon uh, these simple geometries right here. The next thing I'm going to ask us, along with that, for each of these is what is its shape. So that's quickly going to become important as well. Is it What is the primary direction? What are its dimensions? What is it symmetric? Is it asymmetric? Uh, what do the cross sections look like? How do we calculate the area of those cross sections? Are we dealing with 1D, 2D, or 3D? So all that quickly becomes important as well. So within the question of what is known right here, we really have to dive in a lot deeper into geometry, shape, dimensions, all that information. And then we have to ask ourselves the question of, does mass have an effect on it too? Because that's going to dictate which type of equations and relationships we use as well. 
Now from there, we can move on to a complex geometry or complex system here. We used to ask ourselves that same name, uh, same question, what is its name here? But now these might be slightly more complicated. There might be trusses, which have multiple beams, multiple segments within it. Maybe a drive chain, again, has multiple parts. So it might be an entire system rather than just one little piece that does make it more complex. Or the geometry of itself, a fastener, might be more complicated than just a straightforward bar or column. Now it's got threads and everything else associated with it and more complicated geometry. So these are the more complex geometries or systems that we may be dealing with. So now within this, we also need to figure out how does this part or system of parts interact with its surroundings. And that's going to become, again, important as well as we're setting up our governing equations and looking how to solve this problem out. So one of the things and one of the ways in which it reacts with its surroundings and interacts with its surroundings is by these support reactions right here. So for each of these support reactions, um, we have a lot of information given to us. So we need to infer from the information, maybe just given in the problem statement or maybe shown in a diagram, but we need to look at what we're calling these surface loads at the point of contact between the bodies. So the way to think about this is if translation is going to be prevented by using one of these support reactions, whatever it might be, well, the, what's going to happen with that means that there's going to be a force that must be developed in order to, pre to prevent this translation. So, for example, if rotation is prevented, a coupled moment must be exerted. So anytime we can see anything that's going to prevent that rotation, we should know, okay, as I'm doing out my free body diagram, I'm doing out my equilibrium equations, there should be a couple moment that comes into play. So now we can move to the step where we talked about what else is important here, is it moving? Well, if it is moving, how? How is it moving? And how far? How much? How do we quantify this movement here? So we can talk about degrees of freedom. We can talk about is it flying? Is it rolling? Is it sliding? Is it a combination of these? You know, if we're flying, are we dealing with air drag? If it's rolling, are we dealing with bearing friction? If it's sliding, are we dealing with the coefficient of static and kinetic friction? Is it a combination of these? And we need to take multiple things into account as we're doing out all of our equilibrium equations, free body motion. Um, is there impact occurring? What are our associated equations if we're dealing with an impact problem? What is our coefficient of restitution? All that comes into play. Then we can also ask yourself, is there an effect of inertia? And again, we go back to that frictional force, which we talked about with our sliding right here, and how do we bring that into play there? So from there, we can ask yourself, what is it made out of? And sometimes what if it's made out of will lead to information that has to do with friction and things of that nature, how it slides relative to another object. So you might have two different things. Is it ice on ice? Is it glass on metal? Is it sandpaper on wood? You know, all this becomes important for what it's actually made of here. So then we talk about, is it a metal, a polymer, ceramic, elastomer, all that stuff there. And how do we look up our associated properties with that that are important for our problem that we've determined from up above for how it's moving? How does what it's made of affect how it's moving? Maybe it's the weight of it, the density of it. Again, the friction between two different types of materials, things like that uh, become very important. So what it's made of is also crucial. Now we can move on to talk about what assumptions we can make. A lot of times these assumptions will be helpful and help us simplify down the solution to our problem there. So as we're reading through the problem statement and looking at that initial given diagram, what can we do to make some assumptions? What can we infer from that information to simplify down the solution to our problem there? Well, we can look at our geometry and within geometry, we could ask ourselves, are we dealing with one dimension, two dimension, or three dimensions? A lot of times if we're dealing with a one dimensional problem as compared to a two or three D, some of the governing equations can simplify down because we're only dealing with one of those three different dimensions right there. Uh, our symmetry, are we dealing with something that's asymmetric or symmetric? If it's symmetric, can we only look at a portion of the of the diagram, a portion of the problem, a portion of the object there, and then say, okay, well, it's going to be the same for all the other ones that are symmetric to this. Are we looking at primary dimensions? Are we looking at a driving dimension? Is this a dimension that is going to cause the other ones to change? So we only need to pay attention to one because we know the other ones are going to change relative to it. Things like that become important. We can make assumptions based off of that. Then we can talk about assumptions based off of loading and reactionary orientations. Um, as far as loading goes, you know, directions of loading. If we make assumptions, okay, well, we're going to assume that because it's acting with gravity, it's going down. Or maybe they only act in a certain direction. Say, so, well, all these dimension, all these loadings and reactions are only acting in our x direction. There's nothing in the y direction. We can make that assumption that's only moving the x direction. So there is going to be some assumptions we can do based off the geometry of our loadings. From there, we can talk about our degrees of freedom. 
So when we're talking about degrees of freedom, we can consider things such as motion and deformation within our degrees of freedom right here. How is it moving? Is it constrained to only move in one direction? We kind of mentioned up here with our loading right there, but now we're talking about motion. Um, so that for if we're talking about velocities, accelerations, maybe they're only acting in one direction. So the degrees of freedom for the motion. Deformation, we take a look, and this is where I talk about physically moving the pro objects, the, the system, whatever it is and saying okay if i'm going to pull it this way and it's going to elongate in one in the y direction what is it going to do in our x and z directions if we're dealing with 3d or what if it's 2d was it going to do in the x direction if i'm stretching it this way is it going to get smaller and contract or is it going to expand so our degrees of, uh, as far as the deformation go we can make assumptions as far as directionality goes uh, for these deformations as well Stresses, we can also do some def uh, some assumptions based off of that. Sometimes this is information that's given to us within the problem statement. Again, if we're talking about degrees of freedom, we can uh, assume some of these directions of, of the stresses based off the number of degrees of freedom that are given in the problem statement as well. And last, we want to talk about here is the coordinate system orientation. Now, this is something I do want to take a little bit of time and stress on, is many times in these uh, problems or in an actual project, you're not given that information saying you have to use this coordinate system. X has to be in this direction, Y has to be in this direction. This is usually something that you're allowed to specify. And if you're allowed to specify it, how you choose that orientation could greatly reduce down and simplify the solution to the problem there. If you can see a majority of your forces are all acting at a 30 degree angle up a slope, well, maybe choose your coordinate system and skew it so that it's positive X going up that slope. Things like that are going to be important. That's how we can use this coordinate system orientation to help us simplify down the solution to our problems. There are plenty of other things that can lead to assumptions that we can make when solving out these different problems right there or simplifying or reducing down the complexity of our solution to the problems. Another one is talking about whether we're continuing on deformations, are they small deformations? Are we dealing with a linear elastic material behavior? Are we dealing with something that's not plastic or non-linear? How does that affect our governing equations there? Orientations of the loads and reactions change little. So if there's not much change between them, what assumptions can we make into our problem? How can we reduce down these governing equations based off of that information there? Well, one way is we don't need to recalculate it after motion there if there's no, no change or little change. So those are another thing to bring up is these phrases. Very little, stops, uh, almost none, returns to start. Things like that that are worded strangely in the problem statement are things that we can use when we're making some of these assumptions as we're going through. And based upon that, because it says it changes a little, it's only little change or almost no change in there, therefore we say, well, after the reaction or after the motion here, we don't really need to recalculate anything right there because they don't change much uh, according to our problem statement. So as we continue moving forward, making these assumptions, there's a couple other questions that we can ask ourselves. One right here now we're going to focus on is related to how loads are transmitted. So we talk about first about, let's talk about the reactions. What type of reactions do we see in the problem? Maybe given in our diagram or maybe in our actual word statement at the beginning of the problem right there, are these pinned or are these non-pinned and rolling? Are they cantilevered? Are there gonna be through elements within the system? Is there gonna be a pinned truss, rigid connection, torques through gearboxes or gears? So all this quickly becomes important there. Let's just take, for example, right here, we have a, a pinned system right here. Well, all of a sudden in a design project here, not only are we concerned about the system as a whole, but if we're talking about a pin right here, a through pin right here, then all of a sudden we gotta calculate, okay, what are the forces acting on that? What are the shears acting on that there? Do we have the right material set up for that right there? So if we can say, okay, in our assumptions, all right, we're assuming this to be a steel and everything else in there is plastic, therefore we're assuming that the pin right here is not our weak point in the system. So this is again, a homework or example problem where it's really simplified down, we're making that assumption there as far as what materials we're using for a pin and how that's going to affect our assumptions for our force analysis on that there. Other things we talk about is steady loading. So is this gonna be static versus dynamic? So if it's a steady loading, are there no accelerations, no impact, we're just physically setting something on the chair and we're not gonna take into account any of the impacts of setting it down. Things like that come into play. If there's no accelerations, how does that reduce down some of our governing equations? Then the other thing here that we can discuss now for assumptions is frictional forces here. So this again, sometimes you have those key phrases of it's on ice or it rolls or it slides smoothly. Things like that come into play and that's where we can make these, uh, we can infer from the problem statement, the wording there that there is no friction from something like that.
So now let's talk about support reactions here. So for this case here, let's just take about two different support reactions right here, a roller and a smooth surface support right here. And we can see we have over here a diagram of what this might look like uh, from a problem or example problem or homework problem or exam problem right there. So are we dealing though with a roller and or are we dealing with a smooth surface? And from that there, what does one our free body diagram look like from this right here? So if we come down here, there's a free body diagram for looking at that there. Now, if we're looking at this as a roller or versus a smooth surface, it's still going to look the same right here. So this is something right here where you might be worded in a couple different ways in a problem, but reality is when we're actually doing our free body diagram, our equations of motion, summation of forces, things like that, equilibrium equations, these are all going to look the same. So this is still going to have this force pushing up by the surface onto either the roller or the smurs, uh, smooth surface support right here on this going up at 90 degrees right there. So as far as our reaction support goes, whether it's a roller or a smooth surface support, it's going to have this same type of look when we're looking at this as a, from a free body diagram perspective right there. Now, the other thing to think about when we're talking about rollers and smooth surface support, well, the fact that it said smooth surface, does that mean they're a coefficient of friction? Um, we don't have any friction going on, it's, there's zero friction going in there, or does it tell us, okay, this bearing has a friction, or this surface, even though it's smooth, has this coefficient of friction? Typically, when we see the word smooth, it means that there is no friction going on there. And unless they specify it in the bearing that there is a friction right there, we're assuming by the fact that they're using a roller, using a bearing, that means that there is no friction right there. So unless they specify and say, yes, here is your coefficient of friction, then these are assumptions that we can make for these types of support reactions. Now, another type of support reaction that we can take a look at here is our single smooth pin reaction right here. So with this right here, we can see over here, if we're given this, two different ways we might see this within a problem statement here. So it might be just a pin between two different members or a pin anchored down to a surface or platform that we're dealing with right here. So with each of these, we can take a look at what our free body diagram would look like at that pin reaction right there. So we can see there's going to be two components right here. It's not just in 1D, it's in 2D here. It's going to have an X component and a Y component. Our orientation of that is going to be dependent upon what we choose for a given coordinate system. Maybe we chose the coordinate system to be positive X to the left and positive Y going up there. Again, just pay attention to your right-hand rule to see which direction Z would be positive in, but that's fine to do there. Or even if we're having a pin between two different members right here, that still that pin is going to have those same uh, reaction uh, forces right there, FX and our FY right there. Looking at this over in 3D right now there, now again, I talked about pay attention. If we're talking about our X in one direction or Y in our other direction, what direction does our Z go in, so on and so forth. So pay attention to that. And there are going to be associated moments as well that we can see in this diagram. Now, the next support reaction I want to take a look at here is a simple fixed support reaction right there, whether it's coming off a wall or we can see down here sitting on a table like this. What we can see is we do have associated uh, free body diagrams here. And now we can see we do have a, a shear force right here, our F sub Y. We have a normal force, our F sub X, and we have our moment M for this fixed support right there. And the same thing if we're dealing with three-dimensional objects sitting on the table right here. Now we're dealing with three dimensions. So you got your force in your Z, your force in your Y, your force in your X, and you have a moment associated potentially with each of those MX, MY, and MZ uh, for each of those axes as well. So this is for a fixed support. Are there other types of support? Yes, there's other types of supports we might see. So another thing we might see acting as a support here is a cable. So if we're taking a look at a cable right here, a lot of times we can almost think of this as kind of a beam as far as our geometry of this goes. So we can see what is the reaction here if we're dealing with this cable here. You can see you have a load applied on it, stretching it, elongating it by some distance. Delta here for our deformation. Our initial length is L, and we're looking at it, you know, potentially some distance X away from our initial set point right here at the beginning. So we can take a look at that, and if we're going out some distance x right here at that distance x, we can now take a look at what's going on internal there. So we can say, okay, we're going out this distance x here, and we can see now if we share it right here, take a little section right here, we can say, okay, there's our normal force acting out like that, and here's our deformation, uh, our change in, in, in length right here uh, at that point there. So let's take a look at an example problem here, 2.1. In this example problem here, we have an 1800 RPM motor and it's rotating a blower at 6000 RPM through a gearbox having a known weight. So we can see down our diagram right here, here's our gearbox right here given to us as 20 pounds. So some of the information is given to us within the problem statement. Some of it's given to us with the initial diagram down here. Within the diagram, we can also see that we have a distance right here where this gearbox is mounted of 10 inches between those two mounting tabs right there. Um, now they also want, to, want us to find here 
all the loads acting on the gearbox when the motor output is one horsepower. So we can see we have this one horsepower output down here on our motor that's rotating at 1800 RPM. Here's our blower over here. This is 6000 RPM. We can see our directions of rotation right here. So these are going right here counterclockwise, counterclockwise, all the way up here. These are all rotating counterclockwise right here. The motor, gearbox, and the blower are all rotating with their shafts going counterclockwise. They also want us to sketch out the gearbox as a free body in equilibrium. So we'll do out our free body diagram there. So as we begin our solution to this problem, the first thing we want to do is take all the information that we gathered from reading through the problem statement and looking at that initial given diagram and create our setup page. So we can see here, I have my problem number right here. If this were a homework or exam problem up in the top right, you'd have your name up here, the due date, what assignment it was. Then over here, we'd begin our given section. So the given information is information that we get from the problem statement, the initial given diagram right there. There's going to be four parts to each of these as well. You're going to have the variable name. You're going to have how it relates to the problem, the numerical value, and the units associated with it. So N sub M is our, our shaft speed for our motor right here. That's what the M is for motor right there. And that's an 1800 RPM. Our N sub B is the speed for our blower right there, and that's in 6,000 RPM. Our WGB, or the weight of our gearbox, is equal to 20 pounds. And our W dot here, our power, is equal to one horsepower, which is our motor output. Now, the next thing we want on our setup page is what they're asking us to solve for. So in this case here, they're asking us to solve for two different things. In part A, they're asking us to solve for all loads acting on the gearbox. And in part B, they want us to create a free body diagram of the gearbox itself. Now, the next thing we want to do is what are the assumptions we're making to simplify down the solution of our problem? And these are things that can be inferred from the problem statement and diagram. Well, what we're going to assume here, based on what they give us, is that frictional losses in the gearbox are going to be negligible. So moving forward from here, now that we've created that setup page and we have a good place to go back to look at all the given information from the problem and what they're asking us to solve for, the next thing we want to do is we start our solution is to come up with our governing equations right here. So we can reference back uh, to pages 18 and 19 in our textbook and take a look at equations 1.1 and 1.3. So this is from our textbook over here on the right. This is equation 1.1 three where we have our power right here and horsepower is equal to fb where f is our force in pounds and v is our velocity in feet per minute right here divided by 33,000 right there so we can then replace this here now and say okay velocity if we want to convert that and this is not going to be 2 pi t uh, which is our torque right now uh, times n right there where n is our shaft speed right there all divided by 33,000 we can combine these terms together right here and then we come up with at the end that a w dot or our horsepower our power right there is equal to tn or our torque times our shaft speed divided by 5,252 when we do out the math there. So that's what I've done over here. I just wanted to show you this comes from our book as well and our text if you reference back to it. So if this is a problem, I'd still write that out. Here's my general governing equation right there. I can plug this in from equation 1.3 from my textbook to get this relationship right here to get into horsepower right there. So now what do I know right here? So here's everything that I've written over here from our text right here. Our W dot is our power and horsepower. Our T is our torque and foot pounds. Our N is our shaft speed and RPM, F is our force in pounds, and V is our velocity in feet per minute related to this equation 1.3. So even though it's in our textbook, I just wanted to show you, yes, it's in your textbook, but if you're solving this problem out, your grader, the TA, your teammate, your coworker is not necessarily going to see where you came up with this relationship right here. So this is something that's great for your method section, your approach section, and your governing equations to show this work there. <clears throat> now, we see down here, horsepower is defined as work rate of 33,000 in units of foot-pounds per minute, and that's where that comes in this equation up here, like that. Also, we have the relationship here that one revolution is two pi radians, and we've seen this up here as well when we plug in there. So that's just a little side note of where this equation came from and how it was derived. So now what we can do is we can go back and rearrange that equation 1.3 from our textbook in order to solve for our torque right there. And when we do that there, we can rearrange and see that torque is equal to now this 5,252 times our W dot or our power right there um, in horsepower divided by N 
right there, where n is a value that we have given to us as 1800 RPM, and our W dot is given to us as one horsepower as well. So we can take that information, plug back into this governing equation, there is our W dot, our horsepower right there, there's our n value, or it's our n value right here, do that out and we can solve for the torque, so the torque uh, on the motor shaft right here is 2.92 in units of uh, foot pounds right there. So again, double check. This is a great time for unit analysis. Make sure that everything does work out in the appropriate units that you would expect for whatever you're solving for. In this case here, torque. That does make sense. So now we've done the beginning part of part A and solve for our torque. Now from there, let's move on to our blower. So with the blower, we can take a look at this ratio. We have the motor RPM and the blower RPM, which is 1800 over 6000 RPM right there. We also now have our torque of our, our motor shaft right here, which we just solved for is 2.92 foot pounds right there. We can convert this to pounds per inch right now because everything else we've been dealing with has been inches and not feet. So we want to make sure we do that conversion right here. So unit analysis, even a simple one like this, it doesn't hurt to do this out longhand and double check it right here. So foot pounds right there. Well, in one foot, there's 12 inches. Our feet cancel there. Our feet cancel there. Now we're left with pounds times inches right there. Okay, perfect. That gives us a motor shaft torque right here of 35.01 and now in pound inches right there. So now we can take this torque right here and multiply by this ratio over here between our motor and our blower right there. And we do that right there. And what we find out when we multiply through by this 1800 over 6000 right there is we end up with uh, this relationship down here of 10 uh, pounds times inches for the torque of our going to our blower. So the next thing that we want to take a look at here is our mounting torque uh, reaction right here. So this would be equal to the difference of the blower and the motor shaft torque right there. So if we have the blower and we have the uh, blower, sorry, motor and the blower right there, uh, we just solved for this is going to be 35.01 uh, pound inches, and this is going to be 10.5 pound inches right there. Take the difference between those in order to get this reaction uh, mounting torque right there, which would be 24.51 again in pound inches. Now the last thing that they'd asked us to do is to create a free body diagram for our gearbox right there. So we can see this here. There is our gearbox right there. We can see we have our N sub B and our N sub M right there acting on it right there for our for those. And now we also see there's also going to be weight forces and our forces at the reactions right there where it's bolted. So our weight force is going to be the weight of the gearbox acting down right there. And you have this F sub E A over here and F sub B over here where it's going to be bolted in spot. So this is our free body diagram of the gearbox for part B of the problem that they'd asked us to draw. Let's take a look at example problem RP 2.6 here. So in this problem here, we have a pulley with a known radius that they tell us is attached at its center to a structural member. A cable is wrapped 90 degrees around, so it tells us that 90 degrees around the cable, uh, on the pulley there, and carries a known tension. Now they want us to solve for a couple things in this problem statement here. So in part A, what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw out that free body diagram of the structure supporting the pulley. And in part B, we're going to draw a shear and bending moment diagrams for both the vertical and the horizontal portions of the structure here. So the given information we have down here, there's quite a lot of bit given in this diagram here. So we can see we have it fixed over here, coming off a wall, so it's a fixed support over here. We come out a distance of 48 inches. Now 48 inches, if we drop our line down, that's where the center of this pulley is right here. We can see that the pulley has a radius given to us as 12 inches. We can see we have this cable wrapped 90 degrees around the pulley right there, and we can see there's 100 pounds of tension on that pulley there. This pulley, the center of the pulley, is down 27 inches off of the center of this top beam there, and we can see this extends out a distance here of 12 inches off to the right past where the center of the pulley is. So now that I've had the opportunity to read through the problem statement, take a look at the initial diagram and understand everything that they've given me and what they want me to solve for, the next step is to create our setup page. So we can see on our setup page here, we have the problem number we're working on. All of our known information written here is a given. So what do we know? We can take a look and say, okay, well, our radius of the pulley is 12 inches. So again, four things that we want to include in that. We want to include the variable, the numerical value, the units, and how it relates back to our problem. We also see that we have our tension T, which is the tension in the cable of 100 pounds. 
From there, we go ahead and draw out our diagram. So draw a simplified version of our given diagram here. So we can see, okay, there's my fixed support right here. This distance is 48 inches. There's 12 inches there going down 27 inches to the center of the pulley with a radius of 12 inches. And I have my 100 pound tension force. And again, sometimes I may have just wrote this as T, but in this case here, I had enough room. I wrote it out as 100. Typically, I'd normally leave it as T and you'd come back up here to reference that as 100. What are they asking us to find? Well, two different things they want us to solve for in this problem here. They want us to draw out our free body diagram of the structure. And in part B, they want to find and draw out the shear and moment diagrams. So assumptions that we can make from our given information, what they're asking us to solve for, well, we can assume that the weight of the pulley and the structure are negligible. They don't give us any information regarding that. So that's an assumption that we're going to make there. So now that we've had the opportunity to read through that problem statement and create our setup page with all of our given information, our known information, what we're solving for, and our assumptions, our next step is to begin our solution. So in our solution, the first thing we want to do is we're going to take a look at just the structural member. So not the pulley itself, but just the structural member here. What's going on? Draw our free body diagram, our initial coordinate system, reactionary forces uh, at the support. So that's what we do here in this diagram right here. We can say, okay, I'm going to just go with a standard XY coordinate system with my Y positive going up, my X positive to the right. And I can take a look here and I can see down here, this is where my pulley would attach right here. I'm going to have two tension forces right there from where our cable is pulling down and out uh, over the pulley there. Then I'm going to have my reactionary forces up here where I'm going to have my shear force V. I'm going to have my normal force F coming in here and I'm going to have a moment M acting in this direction here. So that is my free body diagram for just the member itself. So what I want to do from this here is now take the information from that free body diagram and come out with my equations of equilibrium here. So I can see my summation of forces in the x direction and summation of forces in the y direction. I want to deal with each of those separately. So if I take the summation of force in my x direction, I come back up here and say what is acting in my x direction. So my x direction here, I can see I have this force F right here coming in and I have this tension force here. I pay attention to this coordinate system that I chose. I can even write it out again down here next to my equilibrium equations. And I say, okay, I have my... Um, a positive sign here. I have my X positive here and my Y positive going up that way. So therefore, my F force is acting in the positive X direction. My tension force is acting in the negative X direction. So negative T plus F is equal to zero. So T is equal to F, where if I go back to my given information, I already know that T is given to me as 100 pounds. So that's why that setup page is great. Plug that back in for T right there. So therefore, my F is also equal to a positive 100 pounds. Now I want to do the same thing in my y direction here. So again, I recall y positive going up, summation of forces in my y direction. Go back to my free body diagram. Well, I have a negative t right there, and I have a positive v going up right there. So therefore, I have now negative t plus v is equal to zero, where again, I know that that tension given to me in the problem statement is 100 pounds. I can plug this in for 100 pounds here, rearrange this, move our negative t over the other side, so t is equal to v. So therefore, v is also equal to 100 pounds. So the next thing that we want to do now is take a look at our moments from our free body diagram here of just the structure right now. So let's just say we want to take the moments where do we want to take them about. So we look up here. I decided to take them right about here, what I'm going to call point O. This is going to reduce down the complexity and simplify the solution to our problem a little bit. So now we take a look and say, what provides a moment about point O? So if we look at this here, we can say, well, we have this internal moment right here, which is now external on a free body diagram from our fixed support. And we can say that this right here is positive because it's going counterclockwise if we use our right-hand rule according to our chosen coordinate system up here where x is positive to the right and y positive going up. So we have that positive moment there from our fixed support. Now we can also see that this tension force right here is going to create a moment, and that's going to be going clockwise. That's going to be negative if we use our right-hand rule with this coordinate system up here. So this is this force times 27 inches. So that's a negative t times 27. And then we have this tension force here going down which would then be going in this direction here to give us a negative again because it's going clockwise tension times 48 inches right there which is our 48 our perpendicular distance from that tension there so we have m 
minus t times 27 inches minus t times 48 inches is equal to zero. We can pull out a t right here that's common and add our 27 and our 48 right there by the combining these double negatives right here, moving our m to the other side like that. And we can say m is now equal to, when we move that to the other side with those negatives, a t times a 27 plus 48. So we already know our t value here. So t is equal to 100 pounds. So we can plug in our value of t of 100 pounds right there from our given information. We can reference back to our setup page for. So we can now say that moment is equal to, our m is equal to 100 from our tension times that 27 plus 48 for those two distances, or reducing that down, m is equal to 100 times 75 inches, or m is now equal to 7,500 units of pound inches. So now that we've looked at the structure as a whole and then the free body diagram there and done out our equilibrium equations, we now want to break it into two separate members. We want to look at just the vertical portion of the member and just the horizontal portion of the member and treat them separately and look at how the forces and do our equilibrium equations on just each of those separate sections of the member. So if we look at just our vertical portion of the member right here, we just have the part that comes down there. We know its length is 27 inches right there. We use our standard XY coordinate system like this here. We can see we have our force from tension down here of 100 and 100, just as we saw before from where our pulley connects there. And now we have our reactionary forces right here where the vertical portion of the member attaches to the horizontal portion of the member right there. So at the end of that right there, we can say we're going to call this point O. We're going to have an F of X force going in our X direction there, positive. We're going to have a normal force coming up in our F of Y direction. And we're going to have a moment going counterclockwise there. Now with this, we can do our summation of forces again. So we say, okay, where is the summation of forces in our X direction? Well, again, pay attention to our chosen coordinate system here, summation of forces in the X direction. We have a negative 100 pounds right here from our tension force right there, plus our F of X. We don't know what the F of X is yet, but negative 100 plus our F X going in the positive X direction there is equal to zero. Rearrange our only unknown is F X. F X is equal to 100 pounds. We can do the same thing in our Y direction here. We can say, okay, I have a negative 100 pounds there and a positive F Y here. So summation of forces in my y direction, I have negative 100 pounds plus Fy is equal to zero. So therefore, Fy is equal to 100 pounds. Now last, I can do my summation of moments. I'm going to do it about, about point O right there. What are my moments about point O? Well, I have this one here where it originally connects between the vertical and horizontal members of the structure right there, and that's going counterclockwise. That's a positive M right there. Minus now, I have this distance right here, this force right here, times this perpendicular distance of 27 inches. So therefore, I have 27 inches, and this was going around clockwise, so it's negative, my right-hand rule, 100 times 27 is equal to zero. And you can see that this force here does not have any moment that it creates about O because it's right in line with that point O right there. So therefore, these are now our equations, our equilibrium equations here for summation of force in the X. We found our F of X at that point. Summation of force in Y, we found our F Y at that point. Summation of moments about O, we found our moment at that point there. Now we want to go ahead and do the same thing, but now just look at just the horizontal portion of the member right here. So what we can do is we can take that information that we found from the vertical member, add it here, because now we know this is acting on the horizontal member right there, because we broke it off right there before. So we can see now we have a reactionary force from our fixed support over here. We've already solved for that's 100 pounds there, 100 pounds normal force going here. This is our shear force right there. We have our moment that we've already solved for of 7,500 pound inches right there our f of uh, <clears throat> x right here of negative 100 right there and we have our moment over here of 2700 pounds there and then we have our y component of that tension force acting down here that we solve our f of y for our vertical member of 100 pounds there so now this gives us a free body diagram of just the horizontal portion of the member right there so now we can go back up to our problem statement here now that we've completed part a we can go on to part B where we draw our shear and bending moment diagrams for both the vertical and the horizontal structure. Now this problem statement in the original problem was pretty straightforward and easy to read and separated out. Not always the case. What we may want to do is go back to our setup page. So if we go back to our setup page like we see here, we, again, we have all of our given information here, our assumptions. We come back down here now to our find. We say, yes, we've gone through and we solved for part A and drew out the free body diagram of the structure. So we did as the structure as a whole just the horizontal component and just the vertical component. And that's going to be important as we're doing out our shear and moment diagrams where they ask us to solve for those for both the horizontal and vertical components. So now we'll move on to part B. And we'll solve for each of these vertical and horizontal components separately. So that's what we do here. We move on to our vertical component here first. So we take just this. So here's what we drew out by hand for our 
actual free body diagram for our vertical member right there. So we can see, okay, we know all of this. So here's our f of x there, f of y, our moment here. And we had our tension forces from in the cable down there acting at this point down here of 100 and 100. So we draw this out with all of the actual values in it now. And that's going to help us as we're doing out our shear and our moment diagrams. So that's what we do over here. We align. So having these free body diagrams out is great because then we can just line up our uh, shear and moment diagrams right next to it here. So we line up our 0, 0, where we're considering our start point here, just typically where we sum our moments about right here. Draw that line right across there. And there's our 0 line, our reference point right there as we begin our shear and our moment diagrams. So we take a look at our shear. Well, what's our shear diagram right there? Well, that's just 100 pounds. That 100 pounds goes straight through all the way. So when we draw out our shear diagram, we have this rectangle right here that goes up from zero up to right here, our 100 right there in the positive direction right there. So there's our shear right there that we can draw in. Then for our moment diagram, what we do is we take a look and we say, okay, we're going over here. Here's our moment here, 2700. So we start up here at negative 2700 and it goes down to no moment down here when we reach the bottom right there. So that's our moment diagram. It's easier to do. We have our values quick right there to draw into and we can reference back to that free body diagram. Now this was for our vertical portion of the member there. Next, we wanna do the same thing but for our horizontal member. So that's why we broke this down when we did out our free body diagrams for the structure as a whole, then just the vertical and just, uh, just the vertical and then just the horizontal as well. So let's move on to the horizontal. So that's what we do here is we draw out our horizontal number right here for our shared moment diagram. I reference back to what I drew out by hand here and this right here, all information here, we had to solve for the vertical member first to include this in here at that reaction there for our horizontal member. So we draw that all out with our values in. We can say, okay, there's our, our shear right here acting right there at that point right there. And again, that uh, stays constant throughout the whole thing there. We can see other value over there. So it starts at a zero reference right here. So again, this is our zero right here, this fixed member right here, which again is where we're taking that moment about for this guy here. So that first moment here is equal to our 7,500 right there. Then our second moment over here is equal to our 2700 right here. So we can see when we draw out our moment diagram down here, we started at zero, go up here. There we go at this point here, we're at a moment of 7500. Over here, we're at a moment of 2700 right there. We can draw out our moment diagram here just by placing it directly underneath that free body diagram of our horizontal portion of that member.